All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello, hello. Thank you so, so much for taking time out of your busy schedules right before the holidays to be with us today. Uh, my name is Yoshi Domoto. I'm the executive director of the Japan American Society, and so thrilled to have you all here today uh, for such a, uh, I think, timely and really important topic about transfer pricing. Um, Japan is actually Georgia's number one foreign investor. So over 600 Japanese affiliated companies in our state uh, that employ nearly 40,000 people. Uh, and these companies have invested about $11 billion in our state's economy. So a lot happen happening between Japan and Georgia. And certainly a lot of manufacturing companies and suppliers and all these companies uh, have to certainly manage uh, you know, transfer pricing and make sure that they're doing things the right way, right? So I think today's uh, topic is very timely and very important for all of our companies today. So. But uh, without further ado, we'd like to uh, kind of start our presentation and introduce our two presenters. Uh, we have Mr. Stephen Rapp, and then also we have Mr. Samik Shaw from Grant Thornton. So with a round of applause, let's get them started. Thank you. And before we start, I do want to just introduce quickly a couple of my colleagues. Um, Eric Gabay, he's here. Uh, he's an international tax uh, partner uh, working here in Atlanta. We have a uh, Javen, he's a, a, a business development executive. Amy Reeves, who you probably heard, see, saw her emails as well. Um, I, don't, I hope I didn't miss anyone from our TV side. So <laughs> All right. Well, just quickly before uh, we start into it, uh, Samit Shah, I'm a, a transfer pricing partner here in Atlanta. Um, been with the firm for about 10 months, um, but uh, have been in Atlanta for about 17 years, uh, both big four, accounting, um, a regional firm, and now here. Uh, been working with the Japanese uh, business community for quite some time now, um, both on, on what we're going to be talking about here, but also on more operational stuff, you know, transfer pricing, operational, um, making year-end adjustments, making uh, transfer pricing documentation studies, so on and so forth. Steve? Sure. Uh, I'm Steve Rapp, and I've been, I've been at Grant Thornton about four years now, and I've been practicing transfer pricing for over 30 years. And because of that, we're talking about advanced pricing agreement, mutual agreement uh, procedures. I've done more of those than anybody. That's just a testament to how long I've been doing it. So, uh, and, and a large part of all these is, is U.S. Japanese, and they've gone through many phases. It's the U.S.'s most productive relationship for working out transfer pricing. And so it's good to talk to people that, that you know, can feed into experience on both sides and experience with each other. So, uh, but I've been, I also, I care enough about transfer pricing, one, I'm still doing it. Uh, two, uh, I've written a couple of books on the topic that it has, uh, I've been teaching for about 20 years as well in transfer pricing because I don't know anything. <laughs> and so one of the things we might do is not everybody has the same level of, of experience with transfer pricing. So maybe just a, maybe just a few comments here at the front from, from both of us to, to talk a, a little bit, just kind of set the stage. Yeah. So, and I think that's probably plays well into our, in our first slide in terms of just talking about just where we stand on trade, right? If you think about, um, do you mind? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, one more. One more. <laughs> Sorry. So if you just think high level, right, um, you just think about global trade. Um, the studies show, right, and you can see this out in, in the public domain, that uh, Japan is the number four uh, export market uh, for the U.S. Similarly, U.S. is the number four export market for Japan. Um, huge global trade happening, not just, you know, from goods manufacturing, but services. There's... Um, there's also a lot of uh, Japanese headquartered companies that obviously have a multitude of operations here in the U.S. Similarly, U.S. headquartered companies having operations in Japan. Um, with, the, with the numbers you see here on screen, you know, there's bound to be controversy. And with the, with the intercompany transactions that happen, you know, both governments are going to have issue with what's being sold and at what price. Um, one government wants more, one government wants net less. And that's where we come in. That's where the transfer pricing comes in, is just in terms of pricing that transaction. Yeah, I, I mean, just the general transfer pricing, it's helpful to think of it as the 
I mean, we have only had transfer pricing as, issue, as an issue for uh, a little over 100 years. It didn't exist because it used to be corporations did all their work in one location, and you didn't have to have a transfer price. It's only when they started opening distributors in different parts of the world or even parts of the U.S. or different divisions that feed into a, a, a composite uh, product that you had one that spurred all the global commerce that we've had over the last hundred years and also needed transfer price because basically corporations needed transfer price because if you didn't have that concept you couldn't figure out is your distributor making a lot of money or is it just because they're not charged anything for the product so what's an appropriate price there so that's where you've got the need for transfer price from the accounting standpoint very quickly those accountants said, I know, I can lower my tax bill. All I got to do is change my transfer price because supply and demand doesn't, I'm just selling to myself, so that I can shift profits to low tax jurisdiction and make my bosses proud that, that I saved them a lot of money. Uh, governments don't like that so much. They Some say, governments did, right? Some governments did 0%. So they said, hey, come on, bring it here. And so, that's kind of created this issue where governments basically distrust the, the transfer price being set between different parts of the company. And governments always assume it's an attempt to shift the money out of their country. Well, the other country feels the same way, unless that would be one of those. That's right. They know <laughs> Hopefully they're not. But, but, the, but, the, but the deal is, uh, you know, so there, I, you know, there's this healthy skepticism, and because of that, Companies, Japanese companies are some of the best. I, I'll talk a little bit about the stats a little bit later. But there, there, there are pressures to make sure that there's enough profit back at the parent company. There's always been that. That seems to be a business culture issue in Japanese businesses. But I think a lot less of that now, uh, unless it happens to be you, then maybe it's still there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, other other. Like European companies, their cultural climate was more lowest tax result. And that's a lot of the U.S. companies' tax result. That's given us a lot of the OECD activity over the last decade. So transfer pricing is still the biggest issue out there. You see it, you know, a number of times during the year. When you do your tax return, everybody's sweating that. But when you do your year-end adjustments to make sure that you don't have M1, M3 differences, the, uh, you, you face transfer pricing. Your auditors will have tax provisions being set relatively soon, and that sets the stage for uncertain tax position forms with your, with your return in the fall. So. And then the tag on of that, right? If you just think about incorrect transfer pricing at the end of any year, well, if it is incorrect, you not only have the direct tax issue about are you paying the proper amount of tax in each country, but there's a tag on effect of customs. Are you, if you, are you pricing this transaction correctly from a customs perspective? Oh yeah, and they use a different, they use, they use a little different, different pricing different terminology. So right. you, you could, I, as I had one client years ago say, look, could you help me out here? I can't be a crook both on my customs and my, and my <laughs> taxes, because they go in different directions. That's right. so, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, there are ways to address that. We actually convened basically a meeting between the IRS and, and Customs and said, look, here's how we do it. We'll answer any questions, uh, but I'm not doing anything wrong to you, but I'm not doing anything wrong to you. Here it is. Yeah. So that can be done, and that's one of the things that should be done because transfer pricing can be a huge obstacle, but you're going to see this is, you know, we're going to talk about some of the controversy procedures available, and some allow, some allow you to be more proactive. That is probably the silver lining in all this attention, is that the governments are aware enough that if you approach them at the front end, sometimes you can uh, you can get very business-like behavior out of them, and, and it beats, it beats uh, being first accused of being a tax cheat before you sit down at the table. So That's there, right. there, there's that. Yeah, and, and so, you know, to go back to those tag-on effects, right? And, and I, I know I spoke with uh, some of you about what sh shipping containers, right? We, we spoke about that. The, the tariffs 
that is going to come into play here, withholding taxes are going to come to play if you're if you got royalties or service uh, service payments. There's a wide variety of things that come into play if your transfer pricing is not corrected, and and there's 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 a the tag on effects of incorrect transfer pricing sort of multiplies in, as as you go down the other kind of tax avenues. So that's kind of the high level. Um, obviously, we've got. We're talking specifically about controversy here, but again, we want to keep it as high level as possible. Please feel free to interject as we go along. Yeah, we got a um, small group. We, yeah. we, can, we can make this go this, anywhere you'd like. That's right. That's right. Uh, this is, transfer pricing is important. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. It's important to Stephen and I, at least. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and, 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 and Eric, of course, and Eric. Um, so, today we're going to be talking about three different avenues to help remedy some of the, the controversy in, in transfer pricing. The first is the advanced pricing agreements. Um, this is an area that Steve has mentioned. He's got a wide variety of experience. And um, we're going to talk about a new program called the ICAP, the International Compliance Assurance Program. Uh, this is something that just started four years ago. Um, and then we're going to conclude with the mutual agreement pro uh, procedures. Again, something Steve has a, a good bit of uh, experience in as well. Okay, well, let me talk about uh, talk about ABAs. So, I've been doing advanced pricing agreements since '91. Uh, that's when they came out, and that's when I went to the advanced pricing program, uh, you know, uh, advanced pricing program at the IRS and worked on those. And uh, I, yeah, I believe it. I mean, there's there's things in it here that are really, you know, it makes sense that this is a way you deal with it, a, a very ambiguous issue. Because in the practice, transfer pricing is evaluated by, you know, what would be the price that unrelated parties would have uh, put on the transaction you just had, even though you're not an unrelated party. And so there's a lot of examples and comparable companies and comparable transactions, and you're basically pitching to the government that my transaction is like theirs, therefore it's okay. So when you have an advanced price, the, the concern is you you worry that, gosh, I could have a, a problem with my transfer pricing. And rather than wait, the APAs were the opportunity to be proactive. You approach the IRS, and you get five years forward uh, on, uh, agreed, but you prospectively approach the IRS and say, please look at my representation here about the facts, what the appropriate method is, and what the appropriate quantification of what's an okay transaction. And the, you know, at that point, it can be you and the IRS <coughs> most likely going to be, in this, if you're a Japanese company, it's going to be the U.S., Japan, and the taxpayer. So everybody that has to sign off on it is sitting at the table, one-stop shopping. The taxpayer makes their best arguments, backs it up with all the information they've compiled, and then they shake hands all around. And for five years, as long as you comply with that, your transfer pricing is beyond reproach. And that's, that's really what's great. And at the very beginning of the APA program, which was in 91, there were a ton of cases that had rollbacks. And so this was yet, yet another way that they had to benefit. So I saw car companies that had, they saw five years going forward, and they saw 13 years going back. These were big issues. They were not settled. They were hanging over the head of the company. And they basically said, with, once they sat down and went through this, and it wasn't easy, but at the end of that, you shake hands on 18 years. Uh, it's a big improvement. It, and usually, you don't find very many of those that have that kind of tail on them anymore. But every once in a while, you do. Sometimes you have a couple of years. But it's... The biggest benefit of the APA program is that it changes the conversation from one where you, uh, you're you in like a courtroom demeanor to one that's a more of a boardroom. You sit down and the, the staffing at the IRS, at, at IRS APA is very good. A lot of them have 20, 30 years experience with this narrow issue. They frequently, I, I know someone that's at least 20 years just doing Japanese cases at the IRS. So 
They, they're known to the, to the negotiators on the Japan side. They're knowledgeable about you know, the industries that are important here, electronics, you know, anything having to do with engines, a lot of industrial equipment, pharmaceuticals. They've seen it. They've seen it in the context of the U.S. and Japan negotiating it. So they're a very effective group. So that's one of the big benefits is you, you have people that they not only know what they're talking about, they also know who they're talking to on the other side of, of the ocean. And that has made them much more effective. Well, and also, uh, you know, I, I know a number of, of these uh, APA, APMA agents, and uh, they are folks that are pretty practical. I mean, they're, they're not just sitting there saying, this is what it should be. They understand it from the flip side because they've been in industry. They've been in, in the shoes that you guys have been in or in, in my shoes or, or elsewhere, and they understand the practicalities of what companies are facing. Yeah, I so, exam sometimes as a kind of fire it, forget it kind of, I don't like your transfer pricing, this is it, that's my position, take it up with the people, right? right. The people at APA, or now it's ATMA, they, they, they have, they get those positions out of exam, and then they have to turn around and negotiate those with the, the, the Japanese uh, you know, counterparts so they know what's gonna work or what's not gonna work. Yeah. And so, they, they get practical. I'd say I, take every new person there gets practical within two years yeah. because they, you know, you can you can you can say what you'd like it to be all you want. Your cases don't close, so they figure out after a while what it takes for the Japanese side because the Japanese side uh, are also incredibly well experienced yes. and most of them sit in their position twenty years or yep. more. So yep. the, you, you're going into a group that knows each other, and so they can give you advice on the front end. What is good, what the likely outcome is? Yeah, I, I mean that's right. That, that's, that's exactly I, right. Yeah, lean on that every chance I get. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, uh, next slide, Dave. All right, so there are different types of APAs: bilateral versus unilateral. Bilateral means both countries implement. Uh, you can do a unilateral. That's just you and the IRS or you and the other country. But uh, it's about as effective as one hand clapping. You know, they, they, uh, they, this is an issue that begs you to settle both sides of it. And since we're talking about Japan, I can say it's, it's effective here. Uh, the, if you did a unilateral, and it's harder to do a unilateral now because you have to, under the OECD, you have to tell, if you didn't invite Japan to, to, to the party between you and the IRS, you have to tell them they weren't invited. And you have to give them the information yep. that you would be giving them if they came. So that's not a very effective way to yep. approach this. The effective way is to invite them both, take both perspectives into account on the front end, and work work the room a little bit. They are you know, so the unilaterals I just are not effective anymore because you you by agreeing with one you upset the other, and you need both of them. So uh, the Synthetic bilateral is an unusual one. A lot of times you want an APA to have a bilateral. We have to have a treaty, obviously, to have one with Japan. But we don't with everywhere. Uh, and so when you want to do a, you would like to do a bilateral because you want both parties, both governments to leave you alone. Uh, if you don't have the benefit of the treaty, that shouldn't stop you. Uh, it just takes a little bit more work and it's a little bit less formal. We call it a synthetic bilateral. And what you do is you sit down, you tell the IRS, I want an APA, I'd like a bilateral, but we don't have a treaty. This is the government. And IRS says, well, there's no treaty, I can't talk to them. You say, that's fine. This is gonna be like going back to high school. We're gonna pass notes. <laughs> so when I talk to the IRS, I tell, I don't know, whoever it is, it, it, some, some of them just, yeah, sing for it. Uh, I tell them what I'm doing, and I tell the IRS, you know, Singapore's not going to like that position you have. And so you end up doing a lot more work, but it's still worth it. That's right. It, because at the end of the day, whenever you get an adjustment in one country, you've already paid tax on the income in the other country. So you're paying double tax. Not very popular in any corporation I've been to. So the, 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 the avoidance of double tax really only works if you do a bilateral. Uh, and certainty, right? I mean, that's the name of the game here is certainty on your transfer pricing. That's, yeah. That is why you would do any of these. Yeah. So yep. a synthetic is like two unilaterals, right? Where the two countries didn't agree together, but they agreed on the terms. 
And so, and it, 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 I mean, synthetic bilaterals are made up now, right? So, um, the you certainly have a unilateral usually conspiracy. The other country may just be okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's probably not as horrible. They probably don't have the ability to do it. It so it's just it's just getting their it's just getting their input, to make sure that you've anticipated, so you didn't just create yourself a problem by by getting getting certain people. It happened somewhat with India right now uh, in the past, right? With India being as controversial and the audit yearly, a lot of companies went in for unilaterals. And I know that a number of companies have just kind of told the IRS, hey, this is what's going on, rather than going into the full bilateral. Have, have you seen um, a lot of these APAs and otherwise uh, transfer pricing going on between the US and Brazil? Uh, yeah, it's not as easy. Not as easy. Uh, it's not as easy. The, I mean, until the last few years, Brazil didn't even subscribe to the arm link standard. Uh, we don't have much to do with Brazil either. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, their concept wasn't even the same. Right. Uh, they had a very prescriptive Although we model. have plenty of countries that right. say they use the arm standard, but, but, uh, but don't. But we do have a giant treaty with Brazil. <laughs> No, not, not yet. They're talking about it, right? That, that's in the works, I thought, after yeah. they come to terms with the rest of the world. So, so what, what was happening in, the, in Brazil before, if you think about transfer pricing as a whole, just, you know, the, the world kind of follows this OECD law of, of how transfer arms like standard needs to work. Brazil didn't, <laughs> and so Brazil had their own kind of way of working. They had, uh, you know, based on industry, based on types of products that you're selling, here's the gross margin that you need to earn, and you better earn that. Didn't matter. Or we'll tax you at that level. They'll tax you at that level, right? Didn't matter what the arms length standard said. This is what their prescriptive model said. Therefore, in the recent year or two, they've tried to move away from that model and more towards that arm's length standard, uh, but it's still a work in process. Therefore, back to your question around have we seen APAs, not really because of that inherent <coughs> difference in how the transfer pricing was done. I don't know if that answered your question. And part of it was the, the fact that they defied the arm's length standard, sensitized the IRS to activity down there, so they just assumed it was a problem if, if the uh, Brazilian government what you're doing, it must be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, was, that was the problem. Um, does that mean then that we see a lot more audit with respect to Brazilian corporations? I, I mean, I no, I wouldn't say in the no. U.S. I wouldn't yeah. say so. But part of it is uh, the and, and Brazil's creating some of this. A lot of companies don't do business there because right. because they're they concerned it could upset their their global transfer. And so they do it somewhere else. And the ones that are there, usually it's if it's only a big interest to the U.S. if it's very material by the U.S. standards. And a lot of times it's kind of below the below their threshold. You know, it's funny. It could be, but it just isn't big enough for them to get you're, you're exactly right. Because like I think what you've seen, what I've seen is companies knowing the issues that sit in Brazil around their tax system purposely redesign their supply chains in order to avoid a massive presence in Brazil. So they would set up shop in another South American country as a sort of manufacturing or master distribution entity and set up just salespeople in Brazil and just give them a small remuneration based on their activities rather than setting up a full shop in Brazil because of all the complexities of their law. So, no, because, because of the law, it created a situation where companies just didn't want to do business there, even though there's, what, three, four hundred million people there. It's a big market. I'm sorry, Lily. Thank you. I have a question. Will these demonstrations that are concluded, is that just for 2021 also? That's only 2021 numbers. Wow. Yeah. Japan yeah. is always the top US. Yeah. yeah they, partner in this and partly and plus even even here you can see 
least the potential for what I generally see. So 28 requests came in and 50 were completed. So the deal is the, they have, from the very beginning, had a very consistent you know, <coughs> inventory of cases. And as I watch it, oh, it's a, it's statistics over the last mm -hmm. 10 years, the number coming out from Japan is usually bigger than the one going, number going in. Uh, and part of that, and you, when, you, when you look at all the statistics, the cases between US and Japan have been shortening up the time that it takes to negotiate. They become much more effective because they have history. And, and, uh, and the odd thing is, as a business, as a block of business people in Japan, these advanced pricing agreements have been their forum of choice for dealing with difficult transfer pricing. Uh, there's only you know, two, well, we'll talk about ICAP, but until recently, there's only been two ways to, to uh, deal with your transfer pricing. One is proactively at the front end, before you have any examination uh, in APA, and then on the back end, after an exam, after appeals and all that, is a mutual agreement procedure. Same people involved, same slightly different uh, incentives to how they behave in the process and what they expect to achieve. But it was very telling that the they had dozens, like somewhere around 70 or 80 yep. APAs in the process between the US and Japan, bilateral. They had at one point, they had 80 of those and zero max, meaning business people in Japan decided if I'm going to have an issue, I would rather have it with an APA because they just, as a block, seem to have approached the same. That's not true for any other country. That's right. Canada has probably four times the number of, of, of exam maps to their to an APA. So it's really, really unusual. Is basically that, and it's and it's been effective. If they, if they ever broke out all the stats specifically for Japan, I think it'd be a real lie out there. I kind of know what they are, but they're not formal enough that I can actually tell you. Mm -hmm. so this is my thing. Uh, can I have just a little bit of the uh, APA APR? Yeah, it says it's only 20, but by the end of 2021, so this number is even larger than for 20. Oh, yeah. So I would like to ask uh, how long generally it Too long. Too long. Yeah. No, it's, it's, <laughs> two, two common kind of digs at the APA, at the APA program is that they take too long and they take an average of four years. So I think the Japanese one is probably a bit faster now, like two or three. It's not as quick as three or four. And you, depending on the issue, you know, some issues are harder than others. Mm -hmm. So a relatively plain vanilla one can go through in two years. Mm -hmm. Longer, yeah, longer for I, if you're a car company or pharmaceutical, those are hard issues and they do take longer. But if you were, you know, if you've got U.S. distribution or U.S. auto parts, they are so used to those through between U.S. and Japan that they move those pretty quickly. Thank you. But I would say those those stats are based on new APAs, right? Yes. Renewal APAs tend to be a little faster. Yes, they do. Yeah. The, the idea, yeah, the idea is that once you get an APA, renewing it is about 70 to 80 percent of the companies get an APA So that, that's, it, that tells you it works. Because mm -hmm. why else would they do it? Thank you. Yeah. They talk about abbreviated APAs, but I hadn't seen much there. Uh, in the small case APAs, they're less cost. I, the, they've made it difficult enough to fit into these exceptions that I, they're not really happy with that anymore. It used to be they had a you had, it was an or, you either were a small corporation or you are a bigger corporation with smaller issues of freight and forward. Now they've said and, and so you have to be both and that's definitely. I'm doing one right now, a, a small case APA, funny but, enough. But it is, it is it's pretty It's re really rare. Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. Uh, okay, Any, so this is a process, and I, you know, this is a process. I've been doing this for 30 years, I love it. Is because it, you're basically, think about it in phases. You know, 
think about what you're doing here. You're asking the government to take one of your biggest tax issues, and it usually is your biggest tax issue, and to give you, a, shake hands, give you a contract for five years going forward, that as long as you do this, you're good. Uh, it's, it's unusual. It's also makes all the sense in the world, because the IRS gets benefits of having these too. They have to put less effort in to do one of these than they do to chase people around and see if they're doing something wrong. So it works for them too, and it helps with their treaty relationship. But the process itself is, I'd like to say it's really, really unique. I don't think it's unique at all. Basically, you, 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 you know, the whole thing, you start by having a pre-filing, testing it, you know, saying, this is, these are my facts in executive level, right? This is what I'm asking. I'm going to come in with this methodology, and I'm going to and I'm going to use these as comparable transactions to, to value it. And they they can say one of three things. They can either say get out of here. I've had that happen once. <laughs> uh, uh, they can say, gee, that's great. Uh, that's wonderful. Come on in. I had that happen a lot of times. But one time I said to the client, I go, this is great. When do we start? He said, they liked it that much, I don't need to appeal. Yeah. And I was like, no, oh, okay. <laughs> it wasn't wrong, though. Uh, and I accept that. But mostly what they say is, I've got a couple of concerns about this area. I've got a couple of concerns about the structure of your transactions and who you're using for comparables. But we are familiar with your industry. We know the types of transactions. And I think I understand the group of companies that you're comparing yourself to. We're probably going to agree. But please explain a little bit more here and there. That, that is, that is the most <coughs> common thing, the, the, the reaction is at the pre-filing. So the pre-filing is the part where you've done all your, you've already done your substantive work. Now you just want to see if, you, if they're going to be able to get on board with you. And they, they are experienced enough to tell you that, particularly your Japanese companies. And so what you do is you, from there you progress. Initially, the questions are very open-ended. Tell me about your company. How do you develop your, your research, researched intangibles? Who's responsible for uh, currency fluctuations? Who's re between you and your related party? How do you work? Well, those are ones where you go, you go and talk a long time. And then they're soaking it up, they're getting it, because these are very experienced people. And then they say, okay, and then you, you change, and all of a sudden, the questions are more focused because they're filling in the, the smaller parts of their understanding. And then it changes again, and they're basically challenging, which is a very healthy thing. I very think. healthy, yeah. yeah. So, so you, you progress from those, and that's really kind of like they, they love learning about how businesses work. And they all work a little bit differently, and so that's what, they're, that's what they're trying to fill in. And once they have that, then they're ready to sit down. Thank you very much. We're going to go talk to the... The NTA in Japan. Uh, we we expect this will be you know this this will be the issue. This will be the outcome. And stand by. We may need more information. And at that point, you don't do a lot of work for a while. And hopefully, and that part that's the part that is hardest to tell what's going on if anything's going on. That's where you lose a little time in my right. my expectation. Lose but, a little steam. Yeah. yeah. And then so so through this process, they have basically understood the way you're company works as you tell them. They probed it a little bit to tell if you're if you're you're accurate in the way you describe it. And then they sit down and negotiate you're not allowed to go to those. And having seen those when I was at the government, you're not missing much. Uh, the <laughs> the the negotiation the, the, but it's it's a regular just head to head negotiation between experienced people with slightly different perspectives and the same information in front of them. And so after some time they come back they basically say, we have an agreement, it's this. I, I'd say in most cases, once you get to the point where the IRS says, I'm ready to negotiate with Japan, we're also talking to the Japanese uh, NTA. And so between the two of them, we don't have to go to the meetings to know what they're talking about. Right. You know, we basically, if you see a big issue, if you, something unusual comes out of those meetings that you didn't anticipate, then you didn't do the prep work. Because you should know exactly what they're talking about. And I'd say most times, before they square off in their negotiations, you can take a point that's 
halfway between the U.S. starting position and the Japanese starting position, and that worked pretty well as an estimate. Yeah, and I think throughout Sometimes this process, process you, we have constant communication with both authorities, right? So it's not as if we're in the dark about anything, because not just through the line of questioning as it gets more granular, but also in the conversations that you have with them, you get to really understand where their head's at and where the contentious points are for them. Um, and, and it's through those conversations, too, that before they get to the negotiating table, that you're able to either alleviate those concerns, help them understand it, or really just understand why they're being as as hard on those issues as they are. Um, and, and and to Steve's point, that there's nowhere in this process that should be a black box because it is a very visible process. Um, the you know the, the relationships relationships that you have with the tax authorities. It really comes to bear because they can, they they feel free to call you uh, as that as the process goes along. At one point, they had made finally very clear formally and it made our lives simpler. Is they said in the U.S. rules for for getting one of these, they said any information, written information that you share with the other side, you must make it available right. to us at the same time. Because if you because I've seen people do this, they gave they give all the information to one side and the other side goes. I, I don't feel good about this. Right. Yeah, so basically, and and there were some professionals who had no problem with that. I always had a problem. Yeah. I'm glad they put it in writing. Yes? Dumb, dumb question. When these APAs are concluded, are they made publicly available or no? No. Nope. Actually, there were lawsuits attempting to open it up, and it, it is treated as, ultimately treated as uh, tax return information uh, available internally at the IRS on a need to know basis, but not. I mean, the, for any, for overall, it's short of four years. Yeah. For the first one, the the, the renewals go because renewals a lot of these things. Like U.S. That. and Japan, depending on you know if it if you're a car company, you've got those issues, which those are big. Uh, pharmaceutical technology. Yeah, yeah. Some some of those, I could say it, it might be most of that. If you're uh, auto parts or you know, inbound distribution to back office operations, yeah. right? I mean, stuff like that. A couple of years. I mean, they, the, it's, you know, the question, you kind of know when you think, when you really think about it, you already know what, is this going to be a hard one or not? And, and, and they just refine your understanding of it as it goes on. And you can just call, I mean, I do it all the time, call the IRS and then, I got this issue, I hadn't seen it before, have you guys seen this? Yeah, we have, we just concluded. They don't tell you companies or anything like that, nor should they. But you get a sense even before you go to the pre filing whether they're familiar with your issue, and, and because they really do have just. I mean, they've been doing if they're concluding fifty a year of these for U.S. Japan, they've probably seen your issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Um, any other any, questions? Yeah. Anything else on AP? Any other questions on the APA process, procedures? Um, obviously, that's one avenue to take, preempting any audit, uh, preempting anything that is controversial. That's on the front end, as Steve said, right? That's something that you're going in proactively and agreeing with the government, which is a legal agreement. Right? That's something yeah. that's legally bound as long as you follow the procedures. I mean, everybody loves them. They say two things. They cost too much, and they take too long. Well, they probably say that, maybe. So, right. That's right. Yeah. Does that start when you actually get the approval of the There's, I mean, to me, it, there's only true certainty once you have the agreement. But, so, but right. for things like uh, uncertain tax positions, the fact that you are approaching the governments means it's not a fly by night. Takes a wrong issue and throws it in front of two governments. So even there, there's the ability to, to be a bit more clear on, on your, your tax position. So I, I still I still find penalties for typing when you file. Is that right? No. 
not technically. No. Okay. Not technically. If you ultimately. Yeah. The the so, but the filing that you do is basically it's kind of elaborate. Uh, it but it basically it's bells and whistles added to what you would have had to do for your documentation. So you know you basically your documentation basically you describe your company, you describe your transactions, you describe the you know characterization of the quote unquote tested party. And then the other half of the of the your regular study is to go out and find similarly situated corporations and transactions and evaluate your pricing based upon what you see in the market. And so that the what you do in the APA is take that and add a bit more detail and explanation. Well, it's, bi have, it's bilateral when you go to two, two governments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, if, say yeah, we yeah. have, you know, we have a situation with manufacturing in Japan, manufacturing here in the U.S. Now we want to go to the U.K. or the Netherlands. And so do you we have to get everybody, or two bilateral, or how does that I happen? generally you can do. I've done this before. Do yeah, I've done this before, and it gets <clears throat> it gets very uh, difficult when you get. Three parties. Yeah, yeah, I guess right? I, yeah, I guess I, I always say it's it's kind of it's like schoolyard you know, lessons. Once two agree, the other one is sure they're getting yeah. screwed. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that, so it, it it's it's its own problem. How yeah, so what most people do is they'll do two bilateral. Okay. And yeah. It's, yeah. And, That's and, right. But well and somebody's gonna talk about ICAP, which may address the this this concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, it's a good segue. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, like I mentioned at, at the outset, um, ICAP, it started just four years ago, and it's something that the OECD has kind of put out there as an alternative means of getting some level of assurance through uh, of, of your transfer price. Now, it's a voluntary program that you basically walk into any tax authority with your transfer pricing, with your intercompany transactions that you feel have some, some, some level of uncertainty toward. And what you then get is the government, let's say you walk into uh, IRS saying, hey, I, I sell these products in 10 different countries around the world, and all 10 countries operate in a similar manner to one another. But I don't want to go in for 10 different APAs or 11 different APAs. How do I, how do I get this certainty associated? Well. What the ICAP does is you initiate this process with the IRS. IRS then goes and talks with all 10 countries, and they then come back to you about, here's the issues that each country sees. Now, that's great. It, it provides a great way and a great easy way of getting a level of assurance, but it's not certainty. It doesn't give you any legal protection. And that's the difference between this and the APA program. This is a quick, I think what they're saying is it's around 24 to 28 weeks, right? Rather than approximately four years. Um, they give you outcome letters, they give you all this kind of risk assessment, but what it doesn't do is give you any level of certainty. And- Well, it gives you a warm feeling. It gives you a warm <laughs> feeling. <laughs> I, I kind of think of, the way I think about it is it's kind of like going in for a pre-file meeting, like in your APA program, right? You get the level of, here's where our issues are, here's where our concerns are, but then you can then take that back and based on the risk assessment that comes back, is to really validate, do I need an APA? Do I want to do more robust documentation? What sort of level of of assurance do I get for all of these various transactions? Yeah. And and it's a great, it's a great, it yeah, seems like it's a great You say it's been around for four years, but it's been still very, That's right. very That's limited. Because right. uh, I, had, I hadn't done one yet. No. And uh, the, the it, it's, it's been, it's been under test conditions, essentially. And the OECD is behind it. The US, the IRS is very, very bullish on this right now. And if they are, I 
What do you got to lose? Yeah. I mean, not, not binding. You basically say, here are my issues. It's It addresses the two biggest concerns in APA. Cost too much and and it takes too long. Doesn't take long. And unlike the APA, they've done either. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, yeah. And, and that's it. It's it's free to apply, free to apply. Free. And, and we'll get we'll yeah we can just say and, and so it's, well, it's APA light yeah, it's kind of what some people refer to it. here we go I think this is a good kind of visual of what the differences are so you can see you know a user fee for an APA because you're getting that legal certainty IRS is dedicating a lot of resources as you saw in that uh, process chart that Steve showed like, there's a lot of certain there's a lot of um, uh, resources dedicated towards it, a lot of time that the IRS takes. There's a pretty hefty user fee associated with that. ICAP, there is no user fee. It's a, it's a quick risk assessment that they do, and you get it from a multitude of countries. And you can still go, if you decide, yeah. gee, I, I'm really now feeling uncomfortable. I, now you, I can go to the Now APA. you go to APA. Right. But you probably like the pre filing You've got some indication of how they feel about it. So you know how to write it up. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Do you use some of the information from ICAP to apply to the APA? My guess is you would. Yeah, yeah. because okay. And, well, we, one difference. Hmm? They do focus on the CBCR. Yes. So, yeah, that's so it. can we go two slides back? Because that's, yeah. that's a great. Um, so what you give the IRS for the ICAP is information they already have. It's not really any additional information. So another plus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they they look at tax returns. Um, along with the tax returns, there's the country by country reporting for companies that have over 750 million uh, euro of revenue. Um, it's everything that they already have. Whereas in the APA, you've got to give them everything in the kitchen sink. You've got to give them infer internal information that they may not already have. And, and that is a limitation be. because the CBCR is something they're doing for it. They hadn't made it real clear. Uh, assuming it now that it's out of the test phase and in regular application, my guess is they're going to be encouraged to, to drop that down and, do it, and deal with different information yep. because if it works, it should work with, with the, right. the information available and it, you shouldn't have to be that big to be, to be able to use it. That's right. Yeah, so to the point about right that country by country, theoretically, right, it's any company that has over 750 million euro of revenue, but to Steve's point, if it's going to be widely available, if small case APA isn't as widely used, this may be a good remediation uh, or a good risk assessment for those companies that are below that revenue threshold but still want some level of, of certainty. And in fact, I mean, I've been observing the Japanese companies that come in for APAs. I'd say. Two and ten, I would say, you know, really, you don't need an APA. And they say, no, we just want one. Uh, well, this is, this is, I think, made for non-aggressive companies that want to come do, you know, do business in the U.S. and have some free-floating, but not really that obvious, concerns about their transfer pricing. You, you come in, you get, you get the, you know, a relatively swift, you know, uh, assessment and you move on. Yeah, and, and this, the second bullet here around your supply chain, you know, companies that operate in a manner consistent with, with how, you know, in every country, so you've got a manufacturing or maybe a multi, multiple manufacturing entities selling to distributors, all those distributors act similar to one another, right? You may be able to find some sort of level of risk assessment in that because you can then find, okay, if I'm not earning the same profit, what do these countries think? If I'm, you know, if they see this country, because in the country by country report, you'll be able to see this. If they see this country earning a 10% profit and I'm only earning three, what, what am I at if risk it, Particularly for? if there's a uh, inverse relationship between tax rates and uh, yeah, profitability. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So th th this, this approach, like, like Steve said, right, this is still in infancy. We haven't really seen any of this yet, but in the public domain, you can read articles about this. The IRS is wholeheartedly running after this. Uh, there's a former colleague of mine, I know Steve's as well, that runs one of this in the IRS, Karen, 
And she has publicly said this is something that we're going to be they pushing more it, of. This is the future. Yep. It uses available information. It's quick and it's friendly. Yes. And and uh, you know you know and that means they can probably they consider that everyone that they say we have no concerns with they feel good about that because that's somebody they probably won't bother. That's right. Well, okay, I think the first thing to note is you're not giving them any additional information they don't already have, right? So that's, that's point one. Mm -hmm. You're not giving them anything more than tax returns, country by country reports, anything that they have already. Now, in theory, their systems have already allowed for them to process who's going to be picked up for audit, who's not. But if you're going to be drawing attention to it, maybe, maybe it will. <clears throat> I, what I would what I would assume is that your profit that you're earning in those jurisdictions already backed up by transfer pricing studies by something that you're benchmarking based on based on. Well, that's something you could provide them and say, look, this is something, this is why we're targeting what we're targeting. Now that risk assessment could just come back and say, oh well, we feel like it's too high or too low or whatever, right? That that, that could be. Uh, what I would assume is that this will at least give you that understanding of what the tax authorities are thinking right. without being in an audit. Another way of saying that is if your company thinks that the profitability is just fine and it's not as far as the government is concerned, you want to find that out now or you have three more years to deal with. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, that would be my experience overall with the Japanese business people is they would like to know that. Yeah. Uh, and it's easy and it's inexpensive. And it, if it was wrong, you'd rather know it, fix it now, and have clean hands for the audit. Because once they pick you up for audit, they just assume they're bad taxpayers. Uh, you know, and, and, and I've, I've never thought that you get, uh, I don't think you get a different result than APA or I don't expect a different, you know, the, the in, in exam. Mostly it's just, Takes longer, takes more effort, and it's you know uh, a lot less enjoyable. So, <laughs> can we get back to yeah? So, you know, I think we've talked a lot about all, all these points, but um, in this, when you say acceptance required, right? Um, in an APA, IRS didn't necessarily need to accept you. You can apply. And they have the reservations, but they didn't have to say no. Now, I mean, that's going to change is what we're reading in the next year or so. ICAP, you do need them to accept you um, because it is something that they will have to spend time on and they will have to work on. So they have to at least go through the procedure. And they of, don't really have a staff there yet. No, they don't. Right. They, they borrow from different, <laughs> right, different places within the IRS. So right. that is a difference. That's right. And so, you know, they will have to accept you as a ICAP participant if and when you decide to do that. Um, on the last piece here, I think we're, where it's, um, where we're seeing probably the areas where you'd want to go in for, right, finite transactions, material transactions, um, these risky transactions, probably good for ICAP, at least as a first step before you decide what to do from there. Uh, whereas APA is good for those recurring, you know your supply chain is going to continuously do these transactions. You know that these transactions are material to the overall company's uh, uh, business operations. That's what the APA is probably going to be best suited for. One other distinction here: the multiple country aspect is so much easier. Yes. The way the way the ICAP works is that you're the country of the I believe it's the. Uh, High, you know, the, the highest, highest, yeah. highest uh, owner in the in the chain, 
that country basically takes on the lead role in contacting the other country when you ask them to, to have coverage on it. APA is so much simpler to do, you know, bilateral. But once you get past that, it, it, it's considerably more difficult. I think this is where the ICAP is going to, and a lot of Japanese companies are set up to, to have you know, so, relatively yeah. similar transactions in different parts of the world. So. I'm thinking they're going to be big, big users. With those supply can. chains, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, any question? Any more questions on ICAP or APA? Uh, the last section, and I know we only have a few more minutes, but last section's on MAP. Yeah, MAP is, like I said, it's not been often for Japanese companies because they, they use APA so much if they feel like they have issues. Now I think a lot of them will say, gee, it's less expensive and faster to get, to get uh, ICAP in. They cover more countries, so I think it's going to be very popular. There. But the you know, mutual agreement is basically the this is once you've gone through exam and appeals and you used up all your remedies in country. If you have a treaty partner, the the you have the opportunity to have a mutual agreement for season 18. The two governments negotiate to eliminate the double cap or will endeavor. Real, if you are the only day, ninety-eight percent of the time, the they, they, they resolve the double tax. But sometimes they don't. Usually, that's when they say the taxpayer was not cooperative. So be cooperative. But so uh, and for the map, this, this is where some of these already been audited. They they adjust it right. So there was income on one side. And so, yeah, it eliminates double tax. That is their goal. Uh, because and because purpose of treaty is to you know, encourage global commerce. Well, getting rid of double taxation is, is a very positive thing. It's, uh, and, it's, and rates are lower now, but I remember seeing cases where yeah. you, without the relief, there would be 75% tax on it, the, a dollar of income. That's unacceptable. So, okay. So, Currently, they, they don't do a, a very detailed job of, of the uh, information regarding the map cases. So Japan has 572. About, <coughs> why is that roughly a third of those, I mean a quarter of those are, are, in, the, are in North America. But like I said, I remember one year, it was just stark. There was zero with the US, and it was just amazing. Uh, probably, I put my finger on Mexico, definitely, but Canada. Canada's got uh, is uh, very problematic. A lot of, lot of yeah, I think it's probably <laughs> where most of those are. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, in the U.S., I'd say you know when these come up, it, it hits all industries. But like I said, not too many Japanese. Usually, these would be the smaller cases, and they would be inbound distributors. You know, of relatively small. Yeah. Because you know, the bigger ones, like I said, all get APAs, uh, and then some of the uh, auto parts companies. Where they, you where they bring some proprietary pieces components over, put them together, and then sell final good. Uh, those are the c common ones that, if they ever end up in that, it's usually the, the, those two types. So can you repeat again? What's the minimum revenue threshold that the IRS typically looks at for these transfer pricing, you know, issues? That They're not going to publish that. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> I mean, it's not. There isn't a minimum per se, but there's a, there's a minimum of ten thousand for whether you're right on, on the penalty. But that's, right. Yeah, that's so. The, so there is. Man, if, if you're doing a hundred million dollars a year, they might look at the. Yeah, I, I, I would have to say I think a lot more depends on one what your name is, uh, <laughs> because a lot of the Japanese companies, and they, I, 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 can, I can say I felt like they used to they used to pick on the Korean and, and Japanese. Because their names alone would kind of give them away. You know, they they say, "Oh, lucky gold star." That doesn't sound like a, you know, like a Nebraska company to me. So, yeah. but then the other thing was would just be, where are you located? Uh, I'd rather you know you 
you might have seen companies who switch their location to New York because in New York they won't be noticed, and in uh, Kentucky they might. Well, as well as industry, yeah. right? So you think about pharma, tech, they're going to be a higher likelihood to be picked up versus a lower manufacturing machinery kind of, you know, lower profit industry versus a higher profit industry, but right? There's no rules here. There's no rules, right? So, you know, there isn't anything that published, like Steve said, um, just historical knowledge and what we've seen. You know, sometimes the, the, they pick up for audit just a routine manufacturer of auto parts and, you know, you give them your documentation, you give them what you've got and probably walk away, right? But um, if you think about, you know, what they're looking at now and there's, there's more talk about what constitutes documentation reports and what, what gives you penalty protection, they're going to be auditing that a lot more now. Yeah, the, the IRS has basically said recently that they, even if you have documentation, if it doesn't meet their quality threshold, they will still impose penalties. For the longest time, if you had a, uh, a memo, yeah. a memo <laughs> that didn't say much anything, they said, there's my documentation. They might adjust you, but they wouldn't would get a penalty. Now, they, I, 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 I asked somebody off the cuff, I said, so is that, are you really, I saw what you guys said and you're frequently asked questions a couple of years ago. Are you really saying no robo docs? Yes, that's what we're saying. If, you're, if your facts don't line up with your method, don't line up with your, your analysis, uh, that's not documentation to them anymore. So if you get, if you're just, if you're spitting out things that have no thought, Going into them, and you can't rely on them. That's clearly covered. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know what to say much about the uh, yeah what's what's going on with these statistics because the U.S. just isn't a big part of That's this. That's right. Uh, it may have dipped a little bit, but uh, the most of the most of the tax disputes on transfer pricing between U.S. and Japan are U.S. generated. That's you right. have a little bit of the oh Coca-Cola's of the world and, and some of some of the big big companies imported imported into Japan, but for the most part, it, it's all coming in the U.S. because uh, the Japanese exporters are you know, have always liked coming to the U.S. market. We yeah. like the products. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. But, uh, yeah. So the, these numbers. I, it's just they're a very experienced country. Uh, they get administrated, but they, the, the business people in Japan seem to prefer APAs over MAP. That's right. When go, dealing with the U.S., because basically it's it's more predictable than an examination. Okay. Um, any questions on just the technical content of what we just went over? Obviously, that we had a lot. Uh, it's. It's a very uh, deep area of transfer pricing, the controversy area. Steve's been working on this for many, many years. Um, I've worked on it for, for many years as well. Um, you know, uh, many of our former colleagues are both in IRS and other tax agencies. Um, we've, you know, we've seen a lot here. So, you know, if any questions do arise, not just about controversy, but just about just general transfer pricing, let us know. Yeah. Is there a requirement that there's a separate accounting firm? transfer pricing versus just signing off on the audit financial? Or what's this? You know? Yeah, I think it really depends on the board. I mean, it's not well, a law but as, as far as, it, it, yeah, there, I have, there are some companies that, that do put that in their rules, but that's their rules. That's not an audit yeah, issue. They, right. Believe me, we get that all the time. Around. Now, a lot of European. Like, yeah, I don't think we can do that kind of work. And it's like, yes, we can. So, so, some yeah. European countries I know have that mandate. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's just not here in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. All right. So just just think of how out loud, right, about wh what you want from a APA representative. It's people who have experience, people who are who know the government, know the government, uh, the the people there well, have a good reputation with those uh, individuals. 
Um, you know, it's basically people that have done this for quite a while, have that experience, have that uh, reputation within the government as well, that hey, these people, they're not trying to pull one over on us, they're, they're trying to give us the proper information, trying to give us everything that we need to do our job well. And, and that's really what you need in the APA because that makes that whole process chart that Steve showed before that much smoother. And I, I think that's where we come in, right? Steve, you've got, I don't want to say years experience, but X 30. number of years experience. 30. Yeah, <laughs> I can say 30, yeah. Uh, myself, right, I've done this for quite a while as well. We've got a, a huge team in, in the US that have done this as well, and also globally. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, we've got a, a colleague, uh, Matt Kramer, who sits on the West Coast. Uh, he's, he's former IRS as well, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Steve. Um, APA. In, in the APA program as well. So, you know, if you think about, you know, our level of experience, I think we've, we've got a, a good wide ranging experience, not just in terms of number of years, but also ex in terms of industries. Um, we've done a number of APAs and have that, not only that knowledge of the, um, of that industry, but also, like I said, you know, we know the IRS well, we know the APMA program. They know um, us. And they know us. And, and they know us and, very well. And uh, I mean, I can honestly say the only reason I can continue to do this is because I don't lie and they know I don't lie. They keep a book on us too. That's so right. They know, you know, <laughs> and the people that they figure out, you know, they figure out that somebody lied to them 10 years ago, they figure it out and that person has a much harder time getting that's right. their client's work through. So, that's right. And, and that's not necessarily wrong. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. And similarly, right, we, we're a global firm, so we've got teams in, in all over the world. Uh, I've only mentioned a few here, but uh, we're, a, we're a global firm. Uh, yeah. have and in Japan, we have people, we have, uh, people that work at the, at the tax authority, Arumi, Yamada, yep. very, very and, technical and, and very capable. And, and yeah, attached in this invite, there was a couple articles. Arumi is the one who wrote that. She's a former NTA. Um, and, and she's with GT Japan, uh, very, I think technical. very, very technical person. Uh, I know she's planning on coming stateside here early next year sometime. So. Well, uh, let us know if there's any questions, any concerns. I know, um, you know, this is a great discussion. Thank you so much for attending, and thank you so much for uh, participating. Thank you.